It is said that an evangelical and faithful minister of Christ was one day addressed by a neighboring clergyman in nearly the following words. Mr. So-and-so, I don't know how it is, but I should really think your doctrines of grace and faith were calculated to make all your hearers live in sin. And yet I must own that there is an astonishing reformation wrought in your parish. Whereas I don't believe I ever made one soul better, though I have been telling them their duty for many years. That there is a preface to the Ten Commandments is important, but that this preface reminds us that God's people had been saved first by the grace of God before they were given the law, and the duty that God requires of man is far more important. Even if you use the word duty to describe our obedience to God, that duty is completely different if we're talking about our duty before or after we have been redeemed. So while we considered under a previous heading our duty and response, responsibility to obey God's moral law simply because he made us, here we're going to fill out that picture by considering <clears throat> how we not only seek to obey God because he is our Lord and our God, but also because he is our Redeemer. After all, putting duty before redemption will not make one soul better. But when the grace of God goes first, uh, there is much to be learned uh, from our duty. That said, uh, the preface itself suggests this idea that redemption comes before duty. Before moving into the commandments, it, uh, as our uh, catechism question indicates, Yahweh reminds his people that he is the one who brought them out of a foreign land and from under foreign rule. Thus, the Ten Commandments are presented to God's people in light of God's salvation from the very beginning. Now, what that preface suggests, other scriptures explicitly teach and importantly in the context of the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look first at Zechariah's prophecy in Luke chapter 1 to see this idea. Luke chapter 1, verses 61, the beginning of, of Zechariah's prophecy, verses 61 to 71. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And the context for this prophecy is the birth of John the Baptist. And Zechariah, when he demonstrates his faith in God by having his uh, son named John, his, his tongue is loosened, and he proceeds to bless God with these words. In uh, this opening verse, Zechariah evokes the Exodus idea as he sets the birth of his son in the context of God's visiting of his people to redeem them, just like God did in Egypt. But then Zechariah jumps forward in redemptive history, and he adds in the covenant with David, the promises of old that God would send a savior from the house and the lineage of David. Then in verses uh, 72 and 73, Zechariah again connects the promises of God with his covenant, specifically his covenant with Abraham that's resulted in two things. That's what he says. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. Now this... Uh, mercy that was promised to our fathers, it results in two things here. First of all, deliverance, and second, having been delivered, then there is a call to serve God without fear. It says, following, picking back up verse 73 at the end, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So first comes deliverance, and then comes uh, a call to serve God without fear. That is to say, a fear of enemies or a fear of judgment. Importantly, our service in response to God's deliverance is characterized by Zechariah here as service in holiness and righteousness. It is service that is characterized by God's own character, which is exactly what the Ten Commandments express in summary form. So we see the same shape, not only in the preface to the Ten Commandments and then moving to uh, those ten words as a reflection of God's character, uh, 
but also here as uh, Zechariah gives thanks uh, in anticipation of um, the Messiah coming uh, in light of deliverance, then we live in light of the character of God in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. The point then is that this pattern of deliverance and then service is established elsewhere in scripture as the standard since Zechariah himself brings up God's covenants with both Abraham and David in the context of deliverance and then service. That's what we see in these in this uh, uh, prophecy. God's grace, therefore, precedes his call to service as a rule. And this order is what gives rise to Zechariah's statement that God's people can serve him without fear. There's no need to fear when God has already acted to deliver you. This is the grace that the evangelical minister in the opening illustration preached. So then Zechariah reminds us that redemption comes before duty, just like the preface to the Ten Commandments suggests. But that is not the only text that teaches this point, and I just want to briefly consider also 1 Peter 1, 17-19. It offers a complementary perspective for us. Start off with verse 17 here. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Here, Peter balances our fearlessness of the world and judgment, which Zechariah rightly proclaimed, with our fear of the Lord. Yes, we are God's children, as Peter says uh, earlier in chapter 1. And we, are, we can rightfully call him our father, but we also cannot be presumptuous. Grace is not license to sin, but encouragement to live a life holy and thankfully dedicated to the one who has saved us. After all, as Peter continues in verses 18 through 19, as our Redeemer, God has saved us from his just judgment by the pouring out of the precious blood of the spotless lamb who is the Lord Jesus. This is what he says. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Thus, a balance is struck between God's grace to save us from our sins and our duty to serve him thankfully and faithfully. Without God's grace, our duty is a grinding, oppressive, impossible obedience. Because we are still enslaved to our former passions, our uh, feudal ways, our former ignorance. But with God's grace made manifest most notably through the coming of his son to save us from our sins, our duty becomes a delight as we reverently uh, um, obey with awe the Lord who has saved us. So to bring this back to the preface to the Ten Commandments, this is why it is so important that these words precede God's commandments. We are redeemed first, and then we are called to live holy lives. That said, let's uh, extend this conversation with some discussion questions. First, what would the Christian life look like if the preface to the Ten Commandments was, for example, an epilogue instead? How would that change the character of the Ten Commandments? Second, how can you balance serving God without fear while conducting yourself with fear in your everyday life? Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this word. We thank you, O God, that you did uh, preface your ten words to your people uh, with this uh, declaration of your redeeming grace to us. Pray, O God, that that would characterize our look at the Ten Commandments as we continue to walk through them week by week. We pray this in the name of the one who has saved us from our sins, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.